OK, so we're all here. Let's get started. So we're continuing our ELE 475 experience. And we're going to uh, continue on where we left off last time, talking about vectors and vector machines. And just to recap, because we went through this really fast at the end of uh, lecture last time, uh, when you have a vector computer, one of the things that you want to do, or the easy thing to do, is to add vectors of numbers. But what if you want to do work inside of a vector? So you want to take a vector, and you want to sum all the elements in the vector. So we call this a reduction, or vector reduction. And if you're trying to do this with a vector machine, unless you have some special instruction, which looks at all the different elements, which is probably a bad thing to do, because if you were trying to do that, then you would lose all the advantages of having lane structures, because you wouldn't be able to partition the elements. Because if you had to do a reduction, you would actually have to have, let's say, one ALU use all of the elements from these different lanes. And that would be, that'd be sad. So if you want to do a reduction, one of the ways to go about doing this is actually have use vectors, but use them sort of temporally. And you can use a, if you will, a binary tree algorithm here to start off with a big long vector that you want to do the sum of all the, the sub parts of this. And the first step is you just cut this in half. And you take this half of the vector and that half of the vector and you add it. And you end up with the partial sums here, which is half the length. Cut again. Add this half with that half. And you can use vector instructions to do that. And I put something half the length. <clears throat> Continue. And at some point, you end up with a scalar, which is the sum. So this is pretty widely used uh, to do vector reductions. Uh, at the end of uh, last class's lecture, we were also briefly touched on more interesting addressing modes. So the vector addressing modes and vector load, loads and stores we've been talking about, up to this point, you could bank very well. And you could assign, let's say, different regions of memory to sort of different lanes. And you would always be able to do a load and actually just read out from your bank that was sort of a, attached to a particular lane. Well, that works well for very uh, well-structured memory accesses. But all of a sudden, let's say you want to do an operation where you have c of d of i. So you have a vector, d. And you want to index into that vector. So it's a vector of addresses. And then you want to take, or, or a vector of indexes. And then you want to take that index and use that to index into C. So this is something you commonly want to do, but you need special support for it. And a basic vector architecture may not have this. Um, but you can add it. And the vMIPS architecture, which is developed in the Hennessy and Patterson book, adds this instruction here called uh, load vector indirect, where you can actually have two vector registers, and the one will index into the other, and then you have a destination vector register. And we call this gather. But your memory system, because you don't know the a priori, if you will, the addressing, your memory system might get patent conflicts, and you need to be able to have all, all the lanes in your vector processor be able to talk to all the memory. That's probably a good thing to do anyway, to make your machine a little bit more flexible and to allow sort of vectors that don't have to align to a particular address. Um, but you have to make your memory system much more complicated to be able to do these sort of gather operations. And the scatter operation is the, the inverse of this. It would be a <clears throat> SVI, a store vector indirect, which would do the store where you have an indirect with a store. So if this would be an on the left-hand side of an assignment operation. OK, so now we get to talk about a couple examples. Or we'll, we'll touch on one example, actually, right now, of uh, a vector machine. And this is what I was trying to say uh, uh, when everyone was coming in, that if you're going to build a really fast computer and make it cost millions of dollars, you should make it look cool. So the picture on the right here is the Cray 1. And um, I've had the pleasure of seeing a couple of these and sitting on a couple of these. Um, and it has a nice little seat built into it. You can actually 
sit down on it, and it's warm because this is a water-cooled machine, and it uses a lot of, uh, uh, this is water-cooled. They later went to uh, something called floor inert to cool these machines. Uh, the Cray 1 was never floor inert cooled, but the Cray 2, I think, was. And the Cray 3 definitely was. But uh, the, the idea is that you uh, use water, and you can have a nice place to sit, so the operator has a nice place to sit down while he's, you know, he or she is working on the machine. And it's uh, heated because there's, these machines are quite hot, and, the, and part of the, the power supplies are actually under the bench here. Uh, the other fun thing about these is you'll notice they're shaped like the letter C for uh, Cray. No one really knows if that's true. I think actually uh, Seymour Cray claims that it's to somehow uh, make the, the distance of the back plane shorter. But uh, it, is, it is shaped like a C, and, and uh, uh, Seymour Cray who's the, the, the founder of Cray, uh, does have a C as the first letter of his name. But for a little bit more from a, uh, or a perspective of what's actually inside of here, the Cray 1 did not actually have lots of different lanes. Instead, what it was, it was a vector computer that had very long pipelines, or long for the time pipelines. It had a couple pipelines for different, different functional units. And it was a register, register, vector, register, register uh, style machine. And some of the, the, the interesting things about this is it didn't have any caches. And, well, didn't have any virtual memory or any, any of that other stuff because this was really sort of a, a supercomputer. You're using this to solve some big problem. So you didn't need all this fancy dancy. Uh, multitasking or virtualization, you ran one really big problem on it. You were trying to, I don't know, somehow model uh, uh, nuclear weapons or use it to crack codes or, or something like that. Here's the, the microarchitecture of the Cray-1. And what you see is they have 64 vector register, or uh, excuse me, eight vector registers with 64 elements each. So their vector length is 64, or their maximum vector length is 64. And they also have a bunch of scalar registers, and they had a separate addressing uh, address register uh, bank of registers. And you can only do loads uh, and stores based on these address uh, registers. What I was trying to get at here is you can see that they basically had only one pipe for each of the different operations, but these pipes were relatively long. So to give you an idea here, something like the multiply with six cycles, floating point multiply took six cycles, um, which today sounds like, well, things are pipeline pretty deep, we have lots of transistors. But you know, it's 1976, there weren't that many transistors, this thing was physically large, so building a pipeline that long took, took space. <clears throat> or, and another example here is I think the uh, reciprocal took about 14 cycles, and that was uh, pipelined, and this did not have interlocking uh, between the different uh, pipe stages and didn't have to have bypassing because the vector length was so long. So you didn't have to bypass from some place in the pipe to some place else in the pipe. They did have chaining, um, but, and, and they did have inter-pipeline bypassing, but intra-pipeline bypassing uh, wasn't, wasn't really there. A couple other things. This machine ran really pretty fast for the days. 80 megahertz was, a, I'm sure, was the fastest uh, clock tick of, of the day. Uh, today, that sounds pretty slow, but that, that, was, that, was, that was pretty good for 1976. 